we, we will start now the first round of the paper sessions. Uh, we have no time to lose, so I would like to give immediately the floor to Peter Westbrook, who will, who will start uh, this session. Uh, Peter Westbrook is uh, Emeritus Professor in uh, Geology, I, I think, at, uh, of Leiden University. Uh, and, huh? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and he uh, wrote uh, uh, several books about very long processes of which human history is only a part. And I think he will now also place human history within a wider perspective of very long-term processes in the history of the Earth, if I'm... So please, Peter Westbrook. Okay. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, I always forget to start. Um, but I've always been divorced, and I think now I've found the key, you know, how it all hangs together. So I'll tell you. Now, this was very much Job Houtsburg's pre preoccupation. He loved this kind of thing. And when we met, in five minutes, we were friends. And we always remained friends and dear friends, you know, because I miss him every day. Yeah. Because he was... He, he was so good at this, and look at, looked at it from the, from the civilization's perspective, of course, and I looked at it from the geological perspective. And I think the two of us, we could have united. But before I found out my stuff, and you may disagree, of course, because it's only, uh, you know, hand-waving, and as it were, now. Although, well, anyway. Um, he died just before I could present it to him. So I never know whether he just would have liked the idea. Anyway, next slide. How do I do, I do this? Oh, here's something important. Nobody told me. Do you know how to do it? Yeah, you, you, you the the do green it. one, though, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, you have to, yeah that's, that's Oh, that's still, the big that's, thing. That's, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, the green okay. one, yeah. And I can't point. Well, Can you grab the, the, the microphone there? Oh, yes. Oh, that's lovely. Now, Job Gautzblom's idea about civilization, I try to sum it up in this figure here. You know, it's very simple. You've got the regimes, the fire regime, the agrarianization, then, and then industry, and you see these, these transitions. You see it all, you know, um, little, little transitions with, which are complicated, and that's also the green blobs there in the rim of the, of the industrialization. That is the fourth... Uh, the fourth, uh, what do you call it, regime or whatever. So that's the perspective he gave, and it was very good that he gave it because I could use it for my stuff. Then uh, I try to give the geological perspective, and uh, I see that there is a transition now going on in geology, but in many fields. and. Uh, we try to, just as David Christie, tell, he likes stories, he's a historian, one thing after the other, and then pass this, and then that, and then that, and so on, and try to see patterns in there. But the new geology is trying to get, explain why does it happen. So first, how did it happen? But this is why did it happen in this way. So you see that there is a big transition. This is the old Earth when it, when it, when it came, came into being. That's 4.5 billion years ago. And that's the recent Earth. And you see there is a kind of evolutionary story. And uh, uh, so it's in a, uh, what I'm gonna, gonna argue is that uh, the Earth is an evolving organization. So we're part of an organization that's over, you know, we're encapsulating kind of organization. And civilization is the present configuration of the Earth. So we have to look at the Earth level. And we always look at ourselves as, as the, the, the key to everything. But we're just, you know, little granules in the, in the whole thing. The big thing is Earth. So, and Earth, I don't mean 
the earth, you know, surface or something, but from the core to the outside, the whole bloody thing is all earth. So, now, let's look at what happened when, you know, the earth got together. Uh, you see that the earth actually is an accumulation of, it, it became into being as an accumulation of star dust. And two things happen when you do this. In the first, you know, the mass increases all the time, so the gravity of the Earth increases too. And eventually, when this, this rain of dust stopped, the gravity was at a level that matter couldn't escape anymore. Only hydrogen maybe, but that's, there are all kinds of mechanisms that keep it in anyway. And of course, uh, nuclear, you know, these uh, space travel now. But you see how difficult it is to get away from the Earth. You need enormous amounts of energy. That's one thing. So the Earth mass is too big for matter to escape. It's important to keep that in mind. And the second thing is that you get heating. Because of these collapses, they produce heat and heats up. And the whole bloody Earth ended as a glowing fluid ball. And that was the Earth at the first days. Now, Let's look what happens in there. And now, and that's the key to this new approach, which is now coming into uh, everywhere you see it now emerging. It's not my intention at all. That's to bring in uh, thermodynamics. And I'll try to explain in one slide what that is. Now, you see the, the Earth there as a hot body. And still, the, co the core of the Earth now is 6,000 degrees. It's about as hot as the surface of the sun. So it's very hot. And, and if, 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 when the Earth emerged, it must have been much hotter. And, and there is, that's one source of, of, of energy. And the other source is solar radiation coming from the outside. And that, of course, is very much uh, a source of energy as well. So uh, and, uh, this whole thing is suspended, as it were, in a very, very cold environment, which is the universe or the cosmos, where it is. Now there is an iron law of thermodynamics. And that means that this uh, matter stays on Earth, but energy follows a different kind of pathway than matter. Energy goes from high grade to low grade, and that high grade is there in the middle where it's so hot. And uh, it does all kinds of works. You see all these wiggling little arrows. Uh, the, it just it does work. It changes the Earth all the time. So the Earth goes through all kinds of configurations, always changing all the time because of this this heat coming out, and then uh, it ends up. It's, you know, the quality is lost of the, of, the, of the energy. So you get low grade energy in the end. So you have a, a, an Earth with lots of variation all the time, moving from one configuration into another. And then there's low grade, and you get these yellow arrows going outside, and the, that energy is just trash. It just, uh, it's just, it's called entropy. It goes out and goes into the cosmos, flows out with the speed of life. It goes very slowly in the Earth because it has to do all its work. That's the idea. So that's the, that's the second law of thermodynamics. And as it does in the first place, the Earth is cooling. It's very hot. It's just like a heater, an electrical heater. You know, put it on, and it gets very hot, but then you put it off, and then the energy flows out, and uh, it's very simple. Now we flip over to the cosmic perspective, which just turns out the other, other way around. We look at this phenomenon from the cosmic perspective, and then you see that the, cosmic uh, the cosmos has an insatiable thirst for energy trash, while we feed on nice bread and food and whatever, high energy stuff, the cosmos loves Trash, energy trash, and it sucks in the trash from wherever it can, and it forces the Earth to press out its trash 
to the maximum. Can you see that? I mean, this is really a very dynamic view. And that's how it works, as I, if I'm right. You know. So what does happen? You see the same picture there. The, the grey should be black there, of course. But uh, you know, it's very hot on the inside. It's 10 degrees at the surface. And in the, in the cosmos, it's two, minus two, 270 degrees. So it's very, very cold there. And the cosmos sucks out the, uh, the, the trash energy. And the energy and the Earth is forced to organize itself because what you have here is a convecting pattern. And geologists are working on that convection all the time. So it's not my invention, but it's something real that is, is going on all the time. Convection means that you have below the, the I can't point here, below you have uh, the, these, these convection cells while they go at the center, they heat up. And then the, the heat flows up, up the, the, these molecules are collective, they, 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 they work collectively. So they heat up and then they move collectively to the outside, they give off their heat and then they move, they cool, of course, and then they go back to the surface, they sink back because it gets heavier. And then that's how these cells are formed and you can see it in every pan with water which you put on a heater, you see this convection going on. Well, that happens on Earth on a very large scale. So this is like plate tectonics is part of that and so on. So uh, this is how the Earth organizes itself. You see, suddenly see this organization. It's self-referential. It's just... Uh, so this is the beginning of, uh, of, of organization. And you see that the Earth undergoes a metamorphosis. And there is an evolution, and the evolution goes in stages, because here too, you have uh, all these different variations going on, and this pattern is selected by the system, by the whole cosmos, as it were. And uh, so you get variation and selection, like Darwin, as the basis of organization. And it's the opposite trend, locally. So you don't go from high energy to low organic, but you get from uh, um, uh, downslope, you go upslope to ever more complex things locally inside that overall trend towards, towards bad or, or trash energy. Then you get the next stage. The Earth is cooled sufficiently for, you know, like it's like oil and water to separate out. So that's what happens. You get an iron core and a mantle outside, and then the crust and the ocean and the atmosphere and so on. And that's what's happening is there is stage two in Earth organization. It's organizing itself. And it ends, it ends up in the right, like, it's like it's, it's right now. So this is also a selected configuration. Why? Because it, it adds, it increases the flow of, of low of, of uh, the trash energy uh, from the Earth to the, to the universe. And the universe or the, the cosmos is sucking this stuff out. And uh, that's why, you know, this, this comes into being. That's stage two. And you see what the effect is. As a result of this separation, you've got two layers of, of, of uh, convecting, uh, one in the core and the outside in the mantle and the rest of the system. So the energy export is now in two compartments as a result of this, this separation and partition in different phases. Okay. Now, I go on one stage further. Here is a convecting earth left, but there you put life in. And life has the property to increase the flux, the efflux of, of trash energy. So that's why I just 
flows of more trash energy comes out and this cosmos says, hey, you know, and he's going to select it because he wants it. See that? And from there, you go on and have civilization. Even more strong, you know, it's burning like the savannas, but also our industry, all of it, is just enhancing this outflow all the time. So it is also selective. It's the earth that does it. That's planetary selection. I hope you understand this, because now we go to this figure, which is earth. A ratchet. And this evolution is ratcheting. You need the previous steps to get the following steps being realized. And this is what happens here. You've got the cockwheel with the lever little thing there. And it can only turn in one direction to the left. And that brings this lift up. So there's the technician who is extremely, the engineer, very proud. But the, the proud, you know, man moves up and up and up. He can't go back anymore, you know. He ends up in the clouds and beyond. And the poor man is just lost. And that's what happens to the earth as well. This is a ratcheting evolution. So you stand always on the shoulders of giants. And it's a cumulative evolution. Okay? So the earlier steps set the stage for what follows, but it goes in a punctuated way. So once you change and change, and then you get this famous word, uh, more is different. It's like Marx, you know, but you also find it in, in, you know, in physics, and so it's, it's the general idea that you change, and then suddenly you get a new kind of metamorphosis, a new stage being realized, which is more effective than the previous one. So that is emergent. And now you see the overview. And we'll begin with the left. You see the central figure moving up. Ver vertical is fine, of course. For geologists, always, you know, we have time. The lowest are the, is the oldest. And you go up and younger and younger. And you get that the Earth organizes itself, or, uh, as, as we've seen and becomes more and more complex. And then you see these, suddenly, the whole thing collapses, you know, you get these narrow constraints. And uh, that's because chaos, which is around the trash or randomness, just is an important thing. It just, it is against the stream of randomness that this grows. So, you see diversity increasing all the time. And you get these constructions, and that's the moment when, when you know, the trash wins from the organization. Now, you move upwards, you end up in civilization. And now we're going to make a longitudinal section, as we call it in, in biology. And uh, you, you like it. An, uh, an onion, you know, you make a section through it from the top to the, to, to, to the roots and you can see the structure and that's what this is. How does it look on the inside? Now you begin very early on with the formation of the earth. And actually you begin earlier than that because you have a heritage, heritage of the cosmos because we have the, you know, we are living, or the Earth was born, nine years after the cosmos originated. That's nine billion years after that. And then you have the uh, formation of time, space, and uh, of the, the periodic table and all that stuff. That's the little white stripe there in the middle. And that's where the whole thing just unites. It's still there. And then you get this formation. The formation is still in the structure. It's in the middle. And then you get around that. And you see the, the stratification of the Earth, which is, I think, the yellow, dark yellow stuff. And then it changes a bit and so on. So you get yellow stripes. And then you get plate tectonics around that. And then life. That's the green stuff. Life tremendously diversified. 
you see is very sensible to change. So it collapses sometimes, but then a new kind of life comes out of it. And that happened many times when the dinosaurs are there very on the top, just below the civilization stuff. In the end, of course, the civilization. And that's also where uh, uh, nature or the bi biology is, 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 uh, is trimmed by, by civilization. And you see, this is all geology. I mean, it has been, it has been reconstructed, but only as a story. But now I give you the reason why it happened. If you understand, this is the tectonic thermodynamics. So that is what the new paradigm is for humanity. For this is civilization. You look, at, I'll go back if I may. There, you look now on top of the right, right figure, you know, from below, you just look at it and see what today civilization is. That's what I see here. You have all these layers in there. They are part of the system. You can't ignore them. You know, we, we still have the periodic table. We still have all these, this, this stratification influences our chemistry. And, and so it works through to today. And that's the view of the sociologists. You know, just ignore the center to the core of it. And I think you can't do it. It's, and also, we have to look at civilization from the global level of, or, of, 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 of organization there. So it's, sociology looks from the wrong perspective. It doesn't look from the global perspective. That's how it's made. Then you can understand who we are and, and why we are, uh, I think, get a better understanding. So, here is what I see, you know, I got this from an old astronomer and Marxist, Anton Pomichel, very famous in the first half of the 20th century. And, and he had this wonderful idea, I think, and it points out what is the difference between animals and humans. Animals have communication, they use tools, they have thinking, the apes, they, all these things are there, but they're not sufficiently integrated. What he said, this is the thing. For some reason, we managed to integrate these things. And this communication gives us, a, 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 the whole thing gives us a tremendous, it's explosive. It becomes explosive at that, that level. Okay, I think that's more or less what I... Okay, okay thank you very much. Do I have just time for one more slide? Yes, uh, 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 yes. two minutes, huh? Two minutes. Oh, all right. <laughs> Civilization is present configuration of the Earth. That's what I claim. So we have to look at the Earth to understand civilization, and we have to look at a higher level of organization than we're accustomed to. And the consequences are that we have a different view of human identity. We are not masters of the Earth, as everybody seems to believe in the present worldview. But we are functional granules. And that we get a totally different view of global <coughs> change. It all hangs together. It, it, uh, and, and it also has deep consequences on, on the worldviews we have. And I would like to add one more thing uh, Homo sapiens is just a misnomer. It's nonsense. We don't exist like that. Uh, that is, that's what we. We don't belong to biology anymore. And Homo sapiens is a biological name. So let's leave it at that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Peter Westbrook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, are all, we are already running out of time, so there's only a, small, a few minutes for one or two questions. Please, who would like to ask a question or have, or have comments on this very broad view of the development of the Earth or the cosmos even. Yes, please.
selective memory. So if you say that some planets are selective about others, that would literally mean they have more children or... But it's, could you, could you so speak somewhat louder? Okay. Here is the mic. Oh, no, yeah. yes, here. This is the one that works. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> uh, as to your uh, planetary selection view, it seems that you are overstretching the, what selection means because literally it would mean that planets that are selected have more children planets or higher fitness, whatever that would mean. And I don't think that is uh, possible. Yeah, but then there is no selection in any way that a biologist you would uh, call it. You get a huge variety of con configurations that are the Earth is producing all that, but then there's one that's probably far very small, and that gives off more entropy or the more more trash energy, as, as I call it here, uh, to to the cosmos. And the cosmos. Oh. Thanks for the elaboration. The next question is by Jan Leiter van Zanden. But, but how does the planet select? What, what is the, the mechanism? The planet selects is the whole configuration. It's the cosmos, the planet, and the cosmos is sucking out of this trash or sitting out of the Earth, right? And the planet reacts by organizing itself, pushing out to the maximum the kind of trash that it's, the cosmos likes and he dislikes. Um, not really, <laughs> but... <laughs> not a planet, and you get here the cosmos and the big surrounding and yeah. encapsulating thing which is hot water and sun. And the planet produces by itself, it's hot, so there's a difference in heat that produces also entropy. Now the cosmos sucks it out as much as it can, and you know, you get this planet moving around because of its hot heat, and it's hot heat. And, and it becomes very uh, diversity. There are all kinds of configurations coming out that it, uh, are forming inside the planet. And then one configuration for a long time, it only happens now in a few times, and then uh, you get a new configuration which has the property to by chance, the property to produce more entropy, more, more trash. That's what the cosmos likes, that the cosmos selects if you want to, you know, be selective. Do you understand what I mean? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter Westbrook. You gave us much food for thought, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I will go give now the floor to Jan Luiter van Zande, who is a professor of economic history of Utrecht University. But what he does is, is broader than just economic history. He wrote many, many books uh, in this field. But one of his other fields is ecological history. And he just published a book with other people about that. And that's what he will talk about now. Please. Thank you very much for uh, introducing me and also for inviting me to give a, a presentation here of the research that we have been doing. It has been research very much inspired by uh, my talks with uh, uh, Joop Goudsblom in the past. Uh, I'll explain a bit during the presentation where his influence has impacted on our story. Uh, but uh, the, the topic uh, the, that we cover in the book that I'm going to present a bit because I have to select certain themes from it, is what happened to biodiversity in the Netherlands in the last uh, 10,000 years, that was officially the, the objective, but it became slightly longer, but it's still 
compared with the previous presentations, it's not the, 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 the real big history, but I would like to introduce the topic of little big history to folk <laughs> as a folk as, as a concept for this kind of work, which was also the kind of work that Joop was doing, of course. He was not really an expert on the Big Bang and what happened afterwards, but he was more focused on the last 10,000 years or so. Or, uh, yeah, is it? Okay. Um, so 20 years ago, um, I had a, a couple of, I met Joop here in this building actually uh, as, as a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences. And we uh, 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 had a, a, a number of chats about, uh, he was trying to build a bridge, I think, with the historians of this world, because in, in Amsterdam that did not work very well, the, the work together with historians. And he saw uh, uh, economic history, history and economic historians as a potential partner, uh, ally in all kinds of debates about what is important in history and historical research. And so we had a number of uh, chats. Uh, I visited uh, his, his home uh, and I was impressed by his uh, uh, broad range of ideas and views of, uh, well, big history, his gentle uh, 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 approach to well, we also discussed a bit about conflicts within the, the Royal Academy of Sciences, I can uh, to tell you. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I uh, uh, was motivated to continue to do research on one of the topics that we briefly discussed, uh, that was this uh, change in biodiversity in the last 10,000 years or so. Um, now so something should happen. So the decline of biodiversity is a well-known issue, of course. It's a very important topic of uh, 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 environmental concern. Uh, there is a, a big uh, story at the moment about the decline of insects populations all over the globe, and especially in uh, the more developed parts of the world. But there are also debates about what will happen to nature when certain species return, like the wolf in the Netherlands that is causing all kinds of problems for uh, nature conservation and for agriculture. And there are big debates about how to manage nature reserves. Uh, is this a, a kind of wilderness that you would like to promote or uh, is this a kind of zoo that you keep in, intact, that, that are more or less the options that are being um, uh, discussed in this. So what we did in this, uh, uh, and, and this is uh, all part of the sixth mass extinction which is now happening on a global scale, uh, biodiversity is declining uh, 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 dramatically. So together with my co-authors, uh, three biologists, ecologists, we have set up a uh, a project, Athena, with a nice website and so on. Uh, I see that uh, I had expected that all the slides were uh, translated, but I have used uh, an old version of the PowerPoint with some of the sentences still in Dutch. I apologize for that, but I will explain, I think, uh, uh, the main uh, issues of the presentation. So. This sixth mass extinction is the background of our concern uh, over the, uh, the problems with, uh, with biodiversity, with nature. Um, most of the historical stories about what is happening to nature in the long run, what went wrong with the relationship between man and nature in the past, they focus on single causes. So, most of those stories have this, uh, the same kind of structure. Then once upon a time, we lived in paradise. There was a harmony between homo sapiens, or men in general, and uh, nature. But then something happened, the fall. Uh, we were kicked out of paradise. And since this fall, there is an ongoing decline of biodiversity in, uh, in
in history. And then the debate among historians is what can we identify as being the crucial change? What was the fall in, uh, in history that we can identify as the root cause of the current ecological crisis? Um, so they, they, that's a relatively simple way of looking at history. And what we try to do in the book is to make it more complex and more uh, dynamic. Um, so for example, there is this influential book by Ponting uh, 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 on a green history of the world, which identified the Neolithic revolution, the, the uh, invention and the spread of agriculture as the crucial moment in world history when things went wrong between man and nature. And there are other... Uh, Christianity has been identified as, as such a break in history, which was the root cause of, of things. Globalization uh, after 1500 has been mentioned as the uh, a, a main cause of problems. The scientific revolution and the uh, enlightenment has often been seen as the crucial moment uh, at which things went wrong. And so you can continue capitalism, of course, which uh, emerges in the 18th century, according to some industrial revolution and so on, consumption society. Um, we were not ha happy um, with that, si that si simple uh, uh, structure of history because also it does not leave any hope for the future. If there is one single cause in uh, the past which is causing the, the biodiversity decline uh, and there are no changes, no developments since, then it's difficult to uh, to see what uh, hope there is for the future of biodiversity. So we have uh, uh, developed a more complex story and I'm going to highlight uh, two elements from this, this story uh, uh, which were uh, uh, a long time ago discussed with Joop as well. So one of the uh, uh, most dramatic developments in biodiversity is a very early development, and that's the extinction of mega fauna. And this starts uh, uh, 70,000 years ago when Homo sapiens uh, leaves uh, exits from Africa and is, going to, uh, is spreading himself and herself over the globe. So uh, this leads to mass extinctions of uh, big fauna all over the world whenever uh, Homo sapiens arrives in Australia or Madagascar or Latin America or Japan, uh, then it can be shown that this has dramatic uh, uh, impact on uh, 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 biodiversity. So there is, um, this giant sloth is just one example of this. But there is a clear correlation this, which has been established by uh, uh, a lot of recent research uh, uh, to confirm the hypothesis by Paul Mart Martin already uh, developed in the late 1960s that uh, large animals tend to disappear whenever Homo sapiens arrives at the scene. And this is a, a very global phenomenon. Uh, and the impact is very large, so about 70 to 90 percent of uh, big fauna of uh, large animals become extinct uh, uh, in this first phase. So this is an argument against Ponting's idea, for example, that hunter-gatherers have a harmonic relationship with nature. Uh, it, it shows that already at a very early stage, Homo sapiens had a very disastrous impact on a large part of nature. Um, and then the discussion is, how was it possible that these few men and women who were spreading for Africa had such an uh, enormous impact on the environment? And there, uh, your story about the, the domestication of fire comes in. I think uh, he opened my eyes, at least, via his book, uh, uh, on fire and civilization, about the huge impact that fire had on environmental systems before the, the agricultural revolution. And um, 
So fire is an important element of the story why this megafauna disappeared so early. But it's not the only part of the story because fire um, was domesticated 400,000, 450,000 years ago seems to be the current uh, uh, consensus. Uh, there is a big debate about that. Um, much earlier than the, uh, uh, the uh, emergence of Homo sapiens. So it's a combination of probably more effective ways of communication, of hunting, of collective action by uh, Homo sapiens and fire, which is probably having this big impact on, uh, 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 on, on the environment in this very early period. And there are even stories that the same kind of causes are important for understanding why only Homo sapiens survives this first selection process, you might call it. So Homo sapiens was a disaster almost from the beginning, could be the conclusion. So whenever we arrived uh, on the scene, um, uh, in combination also with naive behavior of animals, which has been documented for uh, uh, historical societies, um, like uh, Mauritius with the dodo, um, this uh, uh, explains this early decline of biodiversity. Now I'm going to skip uh, a large part of the story because I can't deal with uh, it uh, in detail here in, given the time constraints. And I'm going to step uh, into the discussion about the results, the effects of the industrial revolution on biodiversity. Uh, of course, that, that was the most dramatic acceleration of uh, uh, economic and demographic change in world history, uh, uh, which can be documented quite well. Um, but it also had a, an effect which I did discuss with Joop, so it's, it's interesting to, to, uh, to uh, present it here. He was very much in, uh, impressed by the book by uh, Keith Thomas on, on about man and the natural world. The, the way in which in England already between 1500 and 1800 popular attitudes or attitudes of the elite towards uh, uh, animals uh, was changing over time and how people became more nature friendly in a way. Um, so a, a kind of civilization process which was uh, happening in the uh, the, the, the attitudes of people towards nature. And so this idea we, uh, we also uh, uh, tested uh, uh, for the Netherlands by looking at the kind of words that are being used for, uh, for nature. So in the 19th century, a kind of narrative dominated in which nature was seen as something negative, ongedierte, onkruid, so vermin, weeds are not don't have the same connotation perhaps, but in Dutch it's much more clear, uh, compared to all kinds of nature reserve or, or uh, words which ha have a, a positive connotation for nature. And if you then ca count the use of these words, the negative and the positive uh, uh, uses of, of words for nature, then you get a slide like this, where the green line is uh, the nature reserve uh, line and the, the, the blue and the red one are the negative ones. And you can see that in the 19th century, the, the negative view on nature uh, as something that has to be conquered, that has to be civilized, is the, a dominant. And that only in the, and that gradually after 1900, this alternative interpretation becomes more important and that it really be becomes dominant in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, and if you use other words, uh, reclamation, wastelands, you get a similar picture. So this civilization process, this change in attitudes can be documented uh, in the long run. And we think the real breakthrough of a more positive appreciation of nature 
and was uh, uh, was happening in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, uh, uh, and uh, one of the other questions that we try to answer is what has been the effect of this. So uh, as an economic historian, I try to quantify things occasionally. So one of the things that we uh, 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 put together is a large data set of populations of animals in the Netherlands in the uh, 20th century uh, in order to measure the development of biodiversity for a selected number of populations. You can never measure biodiversity entirely because it's such a complex concept. And uh, But this is the first attempt to do something uh, in that direction. And then you can see that until the 1970s, there's a huge decline in biodiversity, which is what you will expect on the basis of what we know about economic demographic changes in this period. But there is some kind of a recovery after 1970. Uh, it's, and it's not complete, and it's probably also driven by the fact that gradually the data become better and therefore more uh, uh, animals are being counted because if you count better you count more Steam seems to be the general rule but uh, there is a, a, a certain recovery of the uh, deep decline in biodiversity that can be seen in the period until 1970 how are, am I doing in terms of uh, time a few minutes I have a few minutes ok let me then skip this uh, analysis. Um, one of the things that we also see changing is that the relationship between t uh, uh, town and countryside is, is, is uh, flipping in a way. We used to think as, as, as the countryside as the, the place where nature is concentrated and the town is the place of civilization where there is no nature by almost by definition. And that is really changing during the 20th century. Increasingly, people become more friendly towards nature. They start to feed their birds and, uh, and accommodate uh, uh, nature as much as possible and don't hunt anymore. So people are not uh, 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 an enemy of, of nature anymore as they used to be in the past. Um, and in agriculture, uh, on the other hand, becomes increasingly rationalized, more intensive. So uh, the city becomes uh, a, a place where uh, uh, birds, for example, uh, flee to, uh, uh, and, and the countryside becomes a, 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 a desert without a lot of nature. So this is all uh, reflecting the kind of changes in attitudes that, that we have documented. And this all ends with what we call the second domestication of nature. So that's the paradoxical situation we are in now. We all love nature, probably. Uh, we all want to have wilderness to walk in and to enjoy nature whenever we have the opportunity to do that. But on the other hand, um, uh, we know that spontaneous nature will not work in the Netherlands, so we, we uh, manipulate nature as much as possible to make it a, as rich as possible. So we create artificial breed uh, nests for birds, for example, on a huge scale, and, we, and, and there are uh, all kinds of societal groups, pressure groups, uh, who are enhancing the interests of different uh, parts, uh, different animals, different parts of nature. So there's a lot of work in enriching nature. In the 90s, this was called the development of nature, natuurontwikkeling, which was a kind of concept developed in the Netherlands. So on the, on the one hand, we want to have a wilderness in order to really enjoy nature. And on, on the other hand, we know that we will never have it in the Netherlands uh, and that we have to, well, create uh, it into a one big zoo, zooification of nature is what you really see ha happening, verdierentuining van de, de natuur. And th this is the paradox we are in. It's inevitable because if we leave things as they are, we will have no 
nature at all anymore. So we have to help nature to remain rich and remain diversified. But on the other hand, this means that the real goal to enjoy real nature is not uh, attainable. And at a certain level, this is happen on a, happening on a global scale. Elephants will not survive or lions will not survive if we don't support them in, in all kinds of uh, whales and so on. So uh, the, the globe has become one big zoo uh, and we know it and we enjoy it, but it means that we are responsible for what's happening. We can't say, well, we leave things for, for to the spontaneous powers of nature itself. That's no, no solution. We are responsible for what's happening in our big zoo. Uh, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I think our research also shows that you can establish the right conditions for a recovery of nature uh, 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 if you really want uh, and decide to do that. So Thank you very much, uh, Jan Luiter van Sande. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have time for only a few questions. Who, who, who would like to start? Yes. Could you call it the taming of nature that's going on? I mean, there hardly is any nature left. If you, it's, it's civilization and nature are, are enemies in a way, mm -hmm. but they're also friends. But uh, yeah. As you say, but it, uh, civilization can only uh, proceed or expand by taming nature, making making it nice and uh, agreeable, and so things that don't fit there, you know, are just wiped out. Yeah, well, um, we called it civilizing nature, so that's very close to your yeah. taming nature. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, I, I I would accept such a, uh, a concept uh, easily. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Taming would be a nice way of sketching it, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Um, I would like first to say that uh, zooification is a misnomer. It's uh, what we are doing rather is making it a mansion park rather than a dierentuin. Uh, but um, my question is, what do you think of Half Earth, the idea to um, to not inhabit all of Earth, not economize all of Earth, but for quite a while first divide the Earth in two parts and just stay out of the other part. You know about the uh, Half Earth movement of uh, Ed Wilson, do you? No, but I, I can imagine what the, the idea is about. I think it's very artificial to to say we are not going to interfere with half of the Earth. So which which half would be selected? Um, um, so uh, I like the idea to give space to nature. I think that's inevitable. If you, we want to uh, co uh, conserve nature, it needs space. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it, it seems a bit artificial to say uh, 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 half the earth. You need uh, rich uh, nature reserves in all parts of the world. So you can't simply say, let's reserve Siberia for uh, nature. That will mean that the most uh, rich uh, ecosystems will be sacrificed for this. So that's probably not the idea. Uh, but as a general idea that we need to allocate part of the earth of our uh, the space that we have to nature, I think that's that's obvious, that's uh, unquestionable, that that is necessary uh, in order uh, for us to, to be sure that nature will survive in the future. Okay, one, one last question perhaps? Okay, very short. So, uh, whoop, that's loud. Uh, we, we know through the demographic transition that human populations will likely level off. Mm -hmm. So this period of acceleration that we're in, large parts of the world are already um, 
you know, decelerating or mm -hmm. uh, yeah. leveling off, as you would say. Um, how does that impact uh, the return of biodiversity in nature, but also for the parts of the world where large... So if we think about... I don't want to do developing developed world, but just because those words are used, where we still have large parts of nature is in the developing world in places like Brazil um, and other places, well, Latin America is largely through the demographic transition, but Africa is not, yeah. right? They're still in this period of acceleration. Yeah. So how do you, even if here in Europe or in America we want to preserve things, you know, we're in a different place and how do you balance those competing concerns and competing needs um, on a global scale? Well, that's quite a challenge. The, uh, of, of course, the, the, the success of these of, of attempts to preserve biodiversity, are, uh, the, the chances at success are much larger in the, in the rich parts of the world, where we have the resources, where we don't need the land anymore that uh, much in order to survive. So it, 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 there, there is this idea of a, a kind of curve that uh, environmental stress in, increases in the initial phases of economic growth and decreases in the later phase of economic growth. At some point, there is some truth in that. And that means that uh, for Africa, the, the, the future is still very grim uh, uh, in terms of biodiversity loss. That will increase probably. In, uh, uh, but the, the, the chances to uh, preserve nature are much better in the richer part of the world. I think that's what I can say about it. Okay, thank you very much, Jan Luiten van Zande, for this session. Also, thank you, Peter Westbroek. Okay, we have uh, only five minutes now. Then we will continue uh, the, the, the next round of sessions. You can go here or to other...